<laughs> flesh. <laughs> it's hard to walk out there and be cool after you've been in the bathroom. <laughs> so when I, when I, uh, when, Ford, when Bill Ford originally called me, uh, we talked about this, and he, and, uh, he was just kind of uh, getting more and more excited about maybe joining him. And he said, I really, one of the most important things besides saving the company is that we need an orderly transition plan. So whenever you do decide to retire, um, that's going to be something really important that I want to help you with, and I hope you'll help me. And we've done it. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So congratulations, 60 years this month, right? 60 years. And you'd love David. Don't you love him? <laughs> I, I had the fortune to be with David and his, and his uh, wife, Sue, on a number of occasions. And the first time I met him was uh, in, the, in Detroit at Ford Field. And about two months before I met David, the first forecast that I saw for profits, and this is September of 06, the first um, forecast I saw for the entire year profits for 06 was a $17 billion loss. That was in September. And in December, we achieved it. <laughs> so it wasn't like a forecast accuracy issue. It was like we needed a better plan for the Ford Motor Company. And as you know, um, oh man, just, just being here just brings all this flooding back. But we, uh, you know, we clearly had become a house of brands. We bought Aston Martin, Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo, Mazda, Ford, Lincoln, Mercury. And uh, no one knew what Ford was anymore. We lost the soul of Ford. No one knew what the Blue Oval stood for because we were just this house of brands. Also, um, the world was changing. Fuel prices were going up. The consumers wanted uh, smaller and me medium-sized vehicles in addition to the larger ones that Ford had. And we didn't have them. And <coughs> our quality was pretty bad. Uh, many of the, of the Ford store owners explained to me how when they, when they got their cars and trucks from Ford, the, the parts would be in the trunk to finish the vehicle. It was pretty bad, as you all know. And also, we, Ford was sized for around 28% market share in the United States at that time. And we were passing through 9% market share. So we had nearly three times over capacity of everything. And with the agreements we had with the, with the union, we, we couldn't right-size the operation. And most of the, well, all three of the United States companies GM and Chrysler, um, they all had the same agreements. And so they would keep the production up, even though the economy was slowing down and the demand was not there. So they could get the last incremental dollar for the vehicles. Then they'd flood the, the distribution channel. You didn't need the vehicles. The market wasn't there. You'd have to discount them. It would actually ruin the residual values, actually slowed the, the U.S. recovery. And besides that, our cost structure was so uncompetitive, all, all, our all up I think uh, wrap rate at the time was $97 an hour. We were competing against Toyota and, and uh, Volkswagen in the United States that had uh, wage rates around 52, 53. So um, we were losing money on every brand and on every vehicle. And we were within probably six months of being gone. And that's when I met David. Now, David is a really good business person. He's a really good person. And I met him at Ford Field and they had invited all of the Ford dealers to come to Ford Field. And so uh, Diane Craig, I think at the time, came to see me and said, we have all the Ford dealers here and we'd really like, they'd really like to meet you. And I'd just gotten here. And I said, what would they, why would they like to meet me and what can I do to help? They said, well, if you could just tell them why you came, that'd be a good start. You know, you clearly had this great career at, at Boeing and for uh, 37 years and you'd leave that career to come to Ford, which is going to be gone. Just tell them why you came. Is there hope for this? Are we going to be able to save Ford? So at that time, remember, David, everybody at Ford talked to each other and to their dealers and everybody else on teleprompters. That's just what they did. I don't know whether they just didn't want to talk to each other, but everything had teleprompters. And so they had all these teleprompters at Ford Field. And I was up on this big stage, and I walked out and the other presenters that Ford had presented. And of course, the dealers all know the teleprompters are all there. And all of a sudden, when I walked out, the teleprompters went dark. And you could hear this, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Something's going to happen here. This person's going to really like talk to us, like just talk to us without a teleprompter. 
So I shared with them why I came to Ford. And I really, at the end of the day, I really felt like I was being asked to serve a second American and global icon. Because when you look at Bo Boeing and you look at Ford, these are two of the top seven uh, companies in the world. Largest U.S. exporter. We're the biggest provider of jobs and the contributor to economic development in the United States and around the world. And if you look at the automobile industry in total with all of our suppliers, we're nearly 20% of the U.S. GDP, which is why we testified on behalf of our bankrupt competitors. If you'd like to know how to testify in Congress, I'll be glad to share that with you. <laughs> the most important thing is to fly there on your corporate jet. <laughs> it gets the conversation off to a really good start. Uh, so I shared that, and I knew this was I mean, this was serious, and the looks on the dealers' faces were terrifying. And that night, I think I met 17 three generations at one time. And I tried to stay, I stayed, I think, till 11.30 or 12 every night to be able to shake hands and say thank you to every Ford dealer that was there. On, on the second night of the four nights, I had to put my hand in an ice bucket because I had shaken so many hands that my skin had, I mean, it just had swollen up or I couldn't shake anymore. But I had to meet every, every Ford store owner and thank them for what we're going to do, what they're doing, what they're going to do. But they were terrified. And the relationship between the dealers and Ford was like an estranged marriage. They just couldn't stand each other. I mean, Ford was going out of business. They were making shoddy products. Here were three generations of terrific business people that had all these wonderful employees like you, and they were watching this all go away. So it wasn't a lot of working together, and there wasn't a lot of faith in each other. So I was trying to think of some way to get, get the attention of the dealers, but also to get the attention of the Ford employees that were there. That this is going to be different, and we need to partner, because there's nobody in Dearborn that's ever sold a vehicle. It's all here, and that, about that relationship and lifelong relationship. I mean, you're the essence of the Ford Motor Company. So I thought, I don't know where this came from, so I said, okay, remember this, David? I said, so will all the Ford employees please stand up? And I thought, we're at Ford Field and we're all in these round tables, and on, we're on the 50-yard line, but it goes, it almost was to end zone to end zone. All of these, all of these dealers, and they had their, their general managers, and a lot of them had their significant others, and their investors, and, and so I said, will all the Ford employees please stand up? Well, all the Ford employees are sitting on the front row. And I'm thinking, what the hell is that? I mean, this is a dealer meeting, and the Ford employees are up here in front. Why aren't they back there with their dealers and hanging out and at least being back of them? Because for, for that meeting, they, the, uh, the dealers were the customers. So they all stand up, and they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them on the stage. And I'm, So I had to get over that. So I said, <laughs> okay, I'd like all the Ford employees to turn around and face the dealers. So you're, there you are. So you're all the dealers are all sitting out there. So they, so they go. So look at me and they go, like this, and they look at you. And I said, okay, now I want you to tell the dealers that you love them. Well, the, lo the love word had not been used in Ford <laughs> for a lot of years. Just wasn't a, w a word that was used a lot. And so they, they all went like this, and marriage, marriage David's sitting right there. And so they, they go like this, we love you. <laughs> and I said, no, just look at them. Look at them. Look at their eyes and tell them you love them. We love you. No, <laughs> smile and act, li and act like you mean it. And it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy, and then you'll turn to love them. So they went, we love you. And David and a number of the, a lot of the dealers that night told me then and later that they knew this was gonna be, this is gonna be different. This is gonna be led by the, by the Ford stores and all of you and all we had to do was, was get you great products. So you think about the decisions that we made in that first three or four months. We decided that uh, we were going to serve all the markets around the world, which we hadn't made a commitment to. We also decided that we were going to have a complete family of vehicles, which we had never committed to. I mean, if you wanted an F-Series or a Mustang or an Explorer, of course you came to Ford. But we didn't have uh, smaller and medium-sized vehicles. So you look at that lineup today from the Fiesta all the way up through the F-Series and the Transit, most uh, third-party people will tell you it's the finest lineup of any automobile company worldwide. We also, besides committing to a full family, we also committed that every new Ford vehicle would be best in class, and Ford had never committed to that. And we also took a risk by deciding what that meant in terms of quality and fuel efficiency and safety and really smart design. 
And we also agreed um, that we were going to work together, work together with the dealers, with the suppliers, with our unions, uh, with the investors, the customers, and create an exciting, profitably growing forward. And uh, oh, another big decision, I love Ford Credit, and you know how much I love Ford Credit. Uh, our competitors, because they got in so much trouble, all divested their finance company. And we were the only one that kept our captive finance company. And not only that, and there are a lot of people that wanted us to sell it too. And some people, some of the finance people thought we needed to in addition to borrowing the money. And I said, no way. I mean, I mean, Ford Credit is a strategic weapon, I think I even said. And, Ford, and so we actually doubled down on Ford and invested more in Ford Credit, which is absolutely a fantastic part of Ford. So it's good to see you, see you all again. I also made a big decision. A lot of people wanted to get out of the parts business. And we also agreed that we were going to double down and increase our service side of Ford. And so you look at all those decisions that we made, and everything you see today um, is because we all decided to rally around that plan. The other big one um, that people are starting to appreciate now is we knew that we needed to borrow money. And because if we we're going to restructure the business dramatically and get back to profitability in the near term, Plus, we had to invest in all these new products that you see today when everybody else is not going to invest. Plus, the world was slowing down, and especially in the United States, we needed a cushion. We, I, no, no one ever thought we'd have a recession as big as it did, but thank goodness we would borrowed enough money for that. So we went to the banks, and I remember sitting with the, with the uh, uh, finance, and we had laid this whole plan out. It's very similar to the plan that, that uh, I helped lead at Boeing. And, so I said, this is a great plan. They had 500 bankers lined up at the Waldorf Story in New York City. And I said, good luck. Give me a call right away and tell me how, how it goes. And again, the eye contact goes down to the ground. I said, what's wrong? And they said, well, we can't go and, and present this, and we won't raise any money because we've done this before, and they don't believe in us. I said, well, what do you think we should do? And they said, well, you're the only new model we have, so <laughs> you need to go and give the presentation and see if we can raise the money. And so I said, okay. And so I got on that same plane and flew to New York City. And, and two and a half weeks later, we, lit, we raised $23.5 billion based on the strength of this plan and the fact that we were going to do it together for, and to the example of especially the dealers and, and uh, Ford. So how did it all turn out? How do you think it's going? <laughs> Is it incredible? <laughs> let, let me just share a couple things about how incredible you are. This is, the most, this is the most unbelievable business transformation in the history of mankind that I know of. And everybody else says that. I don't need to say that. But we, first of all, uh, we have the best product line of anybody worldwide. Um, in addition to that, um, the brand, the brand movement in a positive direction has moved faster and higher than any brand worldwide ever in history of a large corporation. We were within the top three recognized brands worldwide. And the, and the thing about a brand that when people analyze a brand, they look at do you make great products that they like and value, but also um, are you uh, contributing to a, a longer good term business so you're going to be there for the long term? And are you helping the, the world be a better place? And so on those three dimensions, Ford has had the largest brand movement in a positive direction. We're the number one brand in the United States, as you know. We're number one and number two in all 21 countries in Europe. We're the fastest growing brand in Russia. If Putin would just back off a little bit and get the place going again. And, uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, and we're the uh, fastest growing brand in Asia Pacific. When you look worldwide, we have the number one vehicle, the number three vehicle, and the number six vehicle worldwide. In the United States, uh, we are increasing market share at a dramatic rate. We also, our customer satisfaction is the highest that you, the store owners, uh, put us at the very top of the OEMs or the factories or the, the uh, you call us a factory, I always like that. Who's the, fa well that was me, the factory. Uh, you like us the best. Our suppliers have us ranked number two behind Toyota of the favorite uh, companies they like to work for. The investors are so happy. Our intraday low on our stock price, remember what it was? was a dollar and one cents. It's appreciated approximately 1,837%. And I get 20 letters a, a week and emails 
thanking people for financing their kids' education. They're, they're part of the community. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of investors are very happy. We, paid, we repaid all $23.5 billion. Our debt got up to 20, nearly $39 billion. And now we're down to around 10, and that's about right for our, our capital structure. Um, our employee survey results, the highest I've ever seen by the Mayflower Group is 58% positive, is how the, the employees feel about the company. At Ford, that's 87% now. Feel positive about Ford, where it's going, the relationships they have with the dealers and the suppliers. Okay, so that, so clearly, oh, and we've uh, delivered over, over $9 billion of profit for six straight years. And we're at gradually increasing our margins. And we are getting really close now to being competitive with the best in the world, and that's on margins especially, and that's Toyota and, and Volkswagen. Because remember, every, like we're at like six or seven percent margins, and they're at like 10 or 11. So they're keeping four cents on every dollar more than we are to reinvest in the business. <coughs> And so as we close that gap, we're going to be even better situation for long-term investment. Okay, now back to where we started, orderly succession plan. 